first pitch is expected to be thrown here at 7.05 p.m. I'm Brett Burkhart. We'll get you back to your calls with Ron Owens next on KGO 810. Some, are, some people are ripping up the Mr. Jalal brochures. They're saying women can't be president. It's against Islam. three presidents of the United States. Everybody asked about Burt Reynolds. Uh, Burt Reynolds was on, he had written a book, ostensibly, he had written the book on an autobiography. And it was right after he'd broken up with, um, what was his name, Lonnie Anderson. So I'd prep for the show and I'd come in and he's there. And I'd always liked Burt Reynolds, I thought he was real cool. And he comes in and he's kind of irritable, but that's fine, I mean, I've dealt with that before. And I ask him a question. Well, the very first question I ask him has something to do with the divorce with Lonnie. And he's not happy, but he answers the question. The second one has to do with the divorce with Lonnie. Now he's getting really irritated. The third one I asked had to do with it. He says, why are you asking me these questions? I said, because they're in your book. And I'm showing him the book. And it was the first 20 pages where he was just dumping on Lonnie. Well, he and I did not get along. And then we went to the first break, at which point, he, I looked at him and I tried to defuse the situation and I said, Bert, you know, the anger you just did on the air, is that real or is that fake? And he walked around the uh, table, looked right into my face and said, does this look like it's fake to you, punk? in journalism school and I always remember it to this day because if you want to get the answers that you're looking for you you should follow this and it's it's it seems so straightforward but it can happen often but not to ask two questions in one um, so because then the person doesn't know which one to go with first and you might miss it and then I mean the worst case you just have to ask the question over phrasing is super important in a broadcast interview print as well you definitely want to say things in the following manner. Tell me about, describe for me, what do you make of, explain. All of that will hopefully elicit not only a genuine answer in the imagery pouring forth, but you won't get one word answers. With print specifically, making sure if you're not recording the conversation, the interview specifically for your use, then getting the quote right. Stopping people, this is, this is a very important thing to do. Stopping people so you get it down verbatim, uh, what they're trying to say. And I think um, just a few notes about what they said is not enough. Um, and if you're not using a recorder, um, then stopping and getting those full quotes and filling in those quotes are very important. Too many journalists, and some of them, by the way, are experienced, will allow them, and here's where we get to the don'ts, do not ask questions unless it's really important for a denial and investigative story, did you do this? No. But do not ask questions that could elicit a one-word response. Well, there was a, a well-known actress from the 1930s and 40s named Sylvia Sidney. And uh, at the time that I interviewed her, she was doing a play in Palo Alto, California. And I was not yet an entertainment writer, but I was a feature writer then. And she uh, was uh, doing an interview with me. And at that time, uh, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and some of the older actresses were being put into horror movies like uh, Straight Jacket and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. So I, I asked her if she had been approached to do any of these kinds of things. And she said, I don't like the tone of your questions. She grabbed my notebook out of my hand and looked at what I'd written down there. And she says, interview over. You know? So that, those kinds of things do happen. And I wasn't prepared for that kind of a, of a reaction. But sometimes you get that kind of a reaction. Interview blunders. I think once in a rare while, you're interviewing several different people at once and you might sort of step in it if you can, you know, I thought you were the cousin. Okay, so you're the, you're the brother actually and you know that could be something off-putting. So this, this is the downfall of not having interview questions scripted out because there have been times when I'm, I go to an interview thinking, okay, this is what I'm gonna ask and while I'm in the middle of it, sometimes I get so, um, 
intrigued by what the person is saying that I just like my mind goes blank because I'm just like totally listening to them and I have many times actually not uh, had drawn a blank when I went to go ask my next question you know and I'm like um and and so I just I'm so sorry I just completely lost my train of thought I'd say that, that that's the only you know big blunder I've had but it's embarrassing and so again it can be it can be good to have a piece of paper with some notes maybe written down you know um, so you don't lose your train of thought and seem unprepared when when you're there but most of the people have been understanding which is good there were times initially where I so wanted to jump into a sensitive or controversial topic immediately in an interview and I realized very quickly that was a bad thing to do you save those questions for the end in an investigative piece we've done something completely different. Someone's gonna be on edge, they're gonna be protective at times, they might be ornery, you need to be prepared for that, you need to have specific questions, you need to know your facts so you can refute something that they might say. The person it was, I think it was a, it was a government official in Afghanistan very early on uh, when I started reporting there um, and I wanted to jump into a sensitive issue and I threw out a controversial point and basically shut down the interview. Uh, he was done, he wanted me out, and I didn't have time to get any other point of the interview. And so what I learned from that was um, to get the information that you can before you, you um, present the sensitive or controversial questions. That way if the interview gets shut down, you have all of that information that you started asking early on and it was all neutral territory before it got heated. You might also need to backload the interview and you're saying, what? I mean, in some instances, if you're afraid that they're going to just walk off on you, you need to put that hard hitting question a little to the back. And in those instances, that way, if they want to blow up the whole interview, at least you have something. Uh, that's a technique that can prove rather effective. What happened with Kissinger is I did a lousy interview. I mean, I was so busy trying to show people how much I had prepared and how much I knew. This was at the very beginning of my career. I was 23 years old. Um, yeah, I learned a lesson from that. And then I've now translated, as I got older, I've translated into a phrase, which is, I don't get paid by the word. If I have a good guest, let them talk. It's just the level of candor you've received, uh, the amount of emotion and passion and whatever it was that the person brought to the, the interview. Uh, one of the funniest things, so someone letting me know that I had a great interview. I remember talking to Tommy Lasorda about the business of Major League Baseball. And this was interesting because for him, it wasn't about who won the game or who didn't. It was really getting into the core of what he does, which is an ambassador for his sports and how it works how long these games are, what they should do, talking about expansion, salary, payroll. I think he was refreshed. You know, honestly, I, 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 can rate, I rate myself all the time. I can tell you how the show went. Uh, so, I mean, that doesn't mean I'm perfect, but I have a good idea. When I leave an interview and, and someone smile, when someone who was nervous before is now smiling and like, oh my gosh, thank you. Like that was a lot easier than I thought it would be. Um, that makes me very happy to be able to make people feel, com feel comfortable. Local news is all about building uh, relationships with folks and having people trust you and getting, you know, just kind of being um, involved in the community. And so I like to make them feel comfortable. I look for energy. I like that. I look for an ability to interact with the person. Um, if I got that, I don't care about the substance. I can move, I can handle substance. But a really good interview involves interplay and energy. A really bad one usually is just kind of dull. So technology has changed the way people feel that they can do interviews. Some people feel um, and rely on email as a form of interviewing where as I don't think that that's interviewing, that's getting information and maybe statements or, or those written quotes. But interviewing to me is a face-to-face is, is -face, um, interaction, it's that discussion. I think things are completely different from 10 to, uh, to 20 years ago. Even from when I started five years ago, things have changed. So in the last couple of months, Facebook Live has become so popular. I've done Facebook Live interviews that are just so real, unvarnished, sometimes on very serious subjects. There was one Black Lives Matters protest that occurred at Los Angeles City Hall on just a 
gut-wrenching day for one man. He had learned that there would be, so far, no charges against the LAPD after they shot and killed his wife. And in the context of a 10 minute interview, I was doing a scene setter. I was showing who else was protesting that day. We talked to several different people and we also talked to this poor man who had lost his spouse. I'm still old school. I'm fairly young, but I'm still old school. So it takes me a while to catch on to new technology. But we've got reporters here who are not only running the camera for their interview, but now holding up their phone and Facebook living it. So folks on social media can see it live as the interview is happening. Social media sometimes gives you a different chance to have a longer window, not a short in interview, um, not cut in half. Nobody has to go to the next commercial or anything like that. Not that CNN would do that on such a compelling notion, but Facebook Live and some of the interviews of that nature uh, have really, I think, been a great, great boon to our business. Technology has, I think, made some people lazy in interviewing um, and thinking that that's an interview or a messenger back and forth, messaging back and forth is an interview, but a lot is lost in that the delay, the, the, the limits of uh, the size of messages, the way people perceive certain questions. So I think, uh, if anything, minimum a phone conversation um, is, is still an interview, uh, but a face-to-face -face is always better than any other way. Again, you're, you're there, the way that you ask questions is right there in front of people, can't be edited out. Your, your journalistic skills are out there for the entire world to see now. Um, you can't just pick and choose. So, so things have changed, I would say, mostly with Facebook Live that I've seen. I mean, things are just happening right then and there. You're not waiting for the five o'clock news anymore. I mean, you can live stream an interview, so. Do it in person as much as you can, or over the phone, the human voice is Human voices are uh, obviously two are not exactly alike and it's wonderful to hear people, the, the inflection um, in their voices. You can see their reactions. You can, first of all, you can see a person's reactions and you know how to, how to go. You're not going to step on each other. But secondly, you can get away with things in person that you cannot get away with in, on the phone. If you're on the phone, somebody doesn't know how to quite take it. Whereas you can say here, look somebody in the eye with a smile and say, now what do you say to those who say you're a child molester? And you got the smile, and so they're not going to take it quite that seriously. That's an advantage. I mean, to be honest, yeah, that's one of the things you do. It's only on email or messaging for information. You lose a lot. And as journalists, we care. We need to continue to care deeply about that human interaction. And I think that my, the best stories are the ones that we can actually meet with people face to face. Number one thing is you've got to really know the background of that celebrity. You don't want to walk in there and have not seen their, their film or read their book or whatever. You've got to really know that celebrity well. Start doing your homework, start doing research. And it's easier now than ever. Imagine those uh, journalists of years and years ago cl cutting out clippings. Go online, find out what you want or can find out about the person you're going to interview. Uh, start looking at bios and background information and then talk to that person if you can before and other people about them. When I was in college, one of the tips that I was given by my professor was to write down at least three questions, especially when you're first starting out because your nerves may get to you and again, you're just not as uh, familiar with it. So I think definitely researching the topic that you're gonna be asking questions about and maybe even the person, if it's not just a random person on the street, if it's some sort of a uh, well-known person in the community, research them a, a bit as well. You should try not to ask them what you might think are the standard questions they get everywhere. Try to get off the wall with your questions. And get them interested in, in talking to you. If they think you're just another guy that's going to ask them the same old stuff, you know, they're going to go about it uh, as though it's, uh, you know, they're mowing the lawn or something. If you want them to be lively and to be responsive to you, and the best way to do that is, is to uh, surprise them. I do a lot before I get to an interview. Um, I research the person um, extensively, where they've studied, where they've worked, um, possible grievances that they've had in those places if they've left in a hostile situation, um, uh, maybe as much as I can find just generally about their family, if there's a way to connect, um, if I have anything in common with them, 
Uh, I learned this from a sports writer. You're, you're a mental vacuum cleaner. You're sucking up any little bit of information that could be useful to you before the interview even starts. Everything I can possibly find on the person, books they've written, films they've been in, or if they're an average person, the neighborhoods that they live, um, anything that I can get my hands on, and we're really lucky now obviously with Googling uh, or searching for, for people, um, their LinkedIn, their Facebook, their Twitter, what their opinions are. For radio, how do you prep for an interview? Um, I have a basic rule of thumb, and that is I need to know that I can sit and talk to somebody for one hour without a single phone call. Like, uh, let's say the, everything broke down except the mic. I have to know that I can do that. If I can do that and figure that out in five minutes, I do it. If it's five hours, I do it. Whatever it takes, I need to know that that is covered, that I don't need any help, I can do it. There should be no biases whatsoever. Your goal is to put on record for your network, your newspaper, whatever it is, the most comprehensive and unbiased version of whatever it was that happened. If I have biases, I acknowledge them. Uh, if, I don't, if I feel they can go either way, that's fine. Then, but if I have a bias, I admit it up front and I go from there. Really important that you're comfortable, that you're confident, that you're not somehow disturbing the source. We've talked about a lot of different interviews. Sometimes it's the sensitivity you should have when talking to that husband who lost his wife. When I watch my stories back, I think, you know, when I hear an answer from someone, I'm like, I could have asked it in a different way to have gotten a different answer. But sometimes when you're, when you're in a hurry and, and the person's maybe uncomfortable and you're just trying to get things done, you know, and hindsight's always 2020. But I think there's always different ways you can ask somebody or different approaches you can take. So, but I watch all of my stories back and it's, my husband makes fun of me and says, oh, you're watching yourself again. And it's not because I love seeing myself on TV, but it's because I want to improve. Don't rely solely on email or messaging for information, you lose a lot. And as journalists, we care, we need to continue to care deeply about that human interaction. And I think that my, the best stories are the ones that we can actually meet with people face to face. Focus. Focus is the most important thing. It's amazing how you can lose that. Uh, don't be ashamed. Take some notes while you're going, one word notes and things like that. Don't have prepared questions because if you have prepared questions, then you ask the question, they answer it, and you're on to the next. If you just have, if you need some help, do bullet points because that way you listen to the answer and then you respond to what they say. You want to bounce off of them. You just don't want to have a list of cues. KGO, by the way, tomorrow, our guest at 11 o'clock, U.S. Congressman Eric Swalwell. Be sure you're listening. Right now, we go back to the phones.